Well, hello, Interop Digital. My name is Hank Preston, and I'm here to talk to you about how we built an automated data center network in less than six months. Now, before we jump into the content, I did a quick poll on Twitter to find out if people still like these about me sections to learn a bit about your presenter. And the general feedback was, yeah, as long as I can keep it short. So just a touch about me. I returned back to the network engineering space about six years ago, specifically to help engineers learn how to automate the network. I'd spent the previous five years or so kind of in the cloud, software development, um, hybrid infrastructure space, and I'd been watching as network engineers were uh, struggling with automation and programmability, and I thought I might have something to offer in this uh, at this time for my fellow engineers that are out there. Now that said, I am definitely not the best coder in the room. I've been learning um, along with all the rest of you, and frankly, I've become quite in awe with some of the capabilities and examples that I've seen all of you do and share with the community. Now that doesn't mean I'm not still trying and learning and out there with the rest of you, but I am definitely not the best coder that's out there. Now my day job is architecting and designing the data center networks and the automation that drives them for the DevNet Sandbox team. And the DevNet Sandbox we'll talk a lot about in today's presentation, but it's an area where you can get free hands-on access to Cisco platforms to learn about the APIs that are there. And recently my job expanded to include also the, the automation and the orchestration and architecture around all of the data centers that deliver the Cisco certification classes you may take for a CCNA, or Enterprise Core, or even the DevNet Associate and DevNet Core exams. So we're still driving automation into our own infrastructure places that are there. And 2020 has been a weird year for all of us. And like many of you, I've had some free time pop up and picked up a few new hobbies. I spent a lot of time in my garage and my workshop building some woodworking furniture and late nights looking at the stars on those cloudless evenings, capturing images like this one of the Andromeda Galaxy that I took not too long ago. Now what I'm looking forward to kind of moving ahead, both in the Automation Summit and Interop this week, as well as looking forward to kind of my own time and exploration, is looking more into kind of network verification, oper uh, operationalizing, um, troubleshooting, telemetry, logging, and all of those pieces as they go in. All right, now our topic of the day. I want to share a little bit of the story that we use inside of DevNet Sandbox as we moved into a brand new data center to deliver um, and expand on the services that we offer to our community. We'll start out with a bit about what DevNet Sandbox is in our history, if you're unfamiliar, and then we'll walk through the actual data center project, how we planned how automation would fit in, some of the lessons learned that we've gotten from it, as well as some of the next steps that we plan on our own journey. So. What exactly is the DevNet Sandbox? Well, like the name implies, it's a place where you can go in and you can explore and play and be creative, just like our toddlers do inside of sandboxes. It is a free development lab as a service from Cisco. It's a place where you can get access to both hardware as well as our software platforms to explore all the APIs that have been added to these platforms so that you can better automate and integrate them in with your own platforms and systems. Now we've been out there for several years now and we've got many users. We have over 100,000 users taking advantage of our platform that prov has provided over 250 cumulative years of reservations for developers just like you. And every month our always on sandboxes see over a million API calls. And we said our mission is making innovation easy for every single one of you and the other developers that are out there. Now to do this, we build our own cloud. We do leverage some of the public cloud services that are out there, but we build our own data centers. We build our own private cloud on which we deliver the service. In fact, this is a picture of the data center that we're going to talk about how we built out. Before we get to that, a bit of history, right? Like any good story, there's plenty of ruins and things in the background that we've built on top of as it goes through. Now, prior to our new data centers and the new architecture we have, our network looked a bit like this. And I'm not going to go through box by box. I'm going to focus on the things that we saw were not working correctly for us. Now, our network evolved over time. The DevNet Sandbox idea started many years ago inside of DevNet as a way to give um, small developers and our partners access to verify their services and their applications they were building on top of it. But what we found is that what was a simple network back in the early days, as we evolved and we grew with more Sandbox offerings, more users, our network became very, very complex. 
that complexity was in the number of platforms that we had, software versions we had, traffic patterns would go in and out of the same devices as they uh, transitioned from one security zone to another security zone. And this provided not only difficulties in the actual physical network infrastructure, but it made it very difficult to automate as well. It's really hard to automate a, such a, a variety snowflake style environment that was out there. Now, from a process and tooling perspective, our entire process for building and managing the underlying data center infrastructure was very manual. It had minimal automation, and it was based on the experience our team had as we built and designed these, these services over the years. Now, our source of truth, if you've been in the network automation space for any, so any amount of time, you've probably kind of come up against this source of truth concept. Very quickly, automation uh, platforms and strategies in an organization hit against this area. Well, where do we get the information about how, what the state of the network is supposed to be? Maybe intent, you might have heard it referred to as well. Now, for us, the source of truth for a long time was like many of you. Excel spreadsheets, text files, post-it notes on somebody's whiteboard someplace. Those are not conducive to a good automation strategy. And now from a storage perspective, we had lots of cloud storage solutions. We weren't using source control solutions like based on Git, such as GitHub or GitLab. We had Box or we had OneDrive or Dropbox, just data all over the place. And our configuration across our data centers was very much a snowflake. And we didn't want to get into this. It's just like any one of you with a network behind you, right? They evolve over time. You kind of have to deal with the state that you're in. But we had an opportunity to do it better. We wanted to go after it to make a better solution for our platform to help, help us accelerate our growth into the world and how fast we could deliver services to each and every one of you. And so we tackled this strategy with this concept called Net DevOps. It's one of the things I jumped into really early as I started to talk about network automation and, and try to figure out how this fit into the day-to-day -day efforts around our engineering, um, network engineering and operations. And so what Net DevOps, we, what we've tried to see Net DevOps deliver for us inside of Sandbox is to provide this consistent version controlled infrastructure deployed with parallel and automated provisioning. The idea being that we wanted to get rid of all that color variation across our infrastructure. I wanted boring blue across every rack, every switch, every router in my data center. I didn't want variety, right? Variety is uh, might be exciting, but necessarily I don't want to be excited in my day-to-day -day job as a network engineer and an architect operating these services. Now, from a version control perspective, we needed the ability to be to branch off and explore new mechanisms, new services and capabilities around automation and architecture. But I also needed a way to bring those back together to be consistent and deploy them across the entire infrastructure. And this is where that version controlled concept comes in, bringing that in from the software world into our network infrastructure places. And then finally, right, automated provisioning. Uh, humans are pretty good. We're creative. We engineer some awesome solutions, but you set me down and ask me to repeat the same thing a hundred times across a hundred different firewalls, I'm not going to be very good at that. This is where automation is really key. If I can come up with how do I accomplish something the right way and then use the automation tools to do that at scale across my entire platform, those are huge value props we get. And this was kind of the mindset we had as we jumped into our new data center project. Now, our new data center is called USW1, US West 1, and it's a new data center that we moved into, specifically a colo, so a large cage inside of another data center. And we needed this because we needed a growth potential, we needed higher reliability, we needed higher performance. But the challenge we had was around timing, right? The calendar always gets in the way with these projects. We'd planned for this move for about a year in advance. And then I went off on vacation after Cisco Live US in 2019. And I come back in July of 2019 and my boss says, good news, we've been given approval to move into the new data center. Bad news, we need to be done and into that data center by the end of this calendar year, December of 2019. And so that's where the six months come in. We had a very short window to, to be, be taking advantage of this from all of those non-technical restrictions, the, the policy, the, the legal agreements, finance. And so this broke down to us in a type of a window where we had three months to kind of 
design, test, and prove out any change we wanted to make to our infrastructure and our, our processes. And then we were going to have two and a half months from the day they gave us the keys to our cage to when we needed to be up and providing services out of the data center. Now, along with that, our sandbox leadership team, my bosses said, you know what? This is our opportunity to innovate. Please innovate up to the point of panic. And we did that. We A couple of times we crossed the point of panic and had to come back. We'll talk a bit about how we weighed that as we go through. Now, we'll jump to the end of the story, right? We have been successful. We're certainly not everything's perfect. We're not done. But we're at the spot now where we can automate the deployment of our pods very quickly, where in less than five minutes, we can spin up new pod, 200 new pod environments. And that's a location where we put a reservation that one of you may grab. Now our network in our data center is like many of yours, right? It's a multi-domain network. It's not just a bunch of physical switches that are out there. Our network is made up of Cisco infrastructure like the Nexus data center fabric and Cisco UCS from Compute. And then along with those, we've got our core routing capabilities that route between parts of our data center provided by the ASR 1000 Cisco platforms. And then the Cisco ASA provides firewalls at our kind of layer four uh, style firewall services. And then they're also coupled with VMware virtual switching, right? When you spin up a reservation or you take advantage of one of our sandboxes, if there's VMs behind that. They're running inside of VMware. And that virtual switching layer that VMware provides has to be a part of our network strategy. We also have a management network that we have to keep in line so that we can access all of those, all of our devices and infrastructure that's based on Cisco's Catalyst platform. Our firewalls at the edge of our network are provided by the next generation firewall firepower from Cisco. And then finally, our platform is moving out of the land of physical servers and VMs into containers. And so we leverage a Kubernetes platform based on Cisco's container platform that's out there. And so this entire network stack is what makes up the, the data center platform. And I didn't want to automate just a portion of this, and I didn't want to operate a portion of this separate than the rest. We wanted to tackle this entire network in a consistent fashion, and that's what we went after. Now, as we go into this, it's one thing that we recognized very early. We were told we could innovate up to the point of panic, but we certainly couldn't do everything at once. Six months was a very small amount of time. And in fact, all of the, the work to figure out how we were going to do it, what it was going to look like, had to be accomplished in those first three months because once we got the keys, that was build time. And it takes time to rack, stack, power up, deploy configurations as it goes in. And so we had to hone in. What were we going to focus on? What was going to give us the most bang for our buck, so to speak? And this takes us into planning those first round of network services that we went after. And we needed to know, OK, if we're going to put automation in and we're going to innovate to the point of panic, we wanted to put that time into the place that we would get the most use out of. Now, as we started our, our, our actual design efforts for that, as I mentioned, we weren't in our data center yet. We were, uh, our entire data center was on a CAD drawing where they were showing us where they were, gonna, where they were gonna put walls. We were deciding how we wanted to lay racks out, which meant all of this work for design and efforts had to take place before we had physical space. And this is where Cisco Modeling Labs came in and gave us our first platform that allowed us to automate and deploy so quickly. We use the Cisco Modeling Labs network simulation system to fully design out and model our production grade network, the way it was going to look, down to the types of nodes, bringing in virtualization layers, compute layers. We were able to deploy servers and application systems inside of Cisco Modeling Labs that, so we could actually prove that when we designed the network and we pushed the configurations into it, the applications worked as expected. We even simulated a network or the internet type of a zone and where our customers might come in from the external world through our VPN and public facing portal pieces. This was critical for us to be able to actually do this work and um, do as much innovation and automation as we could. Now with the idea of how we were gonna model the network out, we then started to scope our services. And the scoping factor for this was like, we had to understand, again, what was going to give us the most value for where we were going to put our effort into automation. And so this is a logical representation of what our data center and sandbox networks look like. It's actually not all that complex. We have the cloud that represents the outside world, the internet, where all of you come in from. And then we have a routing layer uh, behind that cloud. 
and a firewall layer. And then we pass things off to different parts of our data center environment. You might go into our sandbox production administrative zone. That's where our portals live. That's where our websites are. That's where all of the, uh, the internal applications live. But then we have all of the hundreds of pods that represent the individual sandboxes that are there. Now, our network, again, our logical network is not that complex, but we needed a way to be able to deploy this very uh, across the common physical infrastructure. And so this is where that concept of underlay overlay network comes in. I needed to be able to control the physical infra infrastructure and then lay around all of these different tenants, these different um, overlay networks on top of that physical infrastructure as it went in. And firewalls make up a huge part of my network as it goes in. We have hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of virtual firewalls that front of each, each of these different environments. And so managing those configurations effectively was going to be a huge portion of our automation strategy. Now to scope these out, again, we were going to target those highest impacts, the underlay and overlay piece. So the way these break in, we took a look at our physical kind of network topology as it went in. And this is the underlay of the environment. And so I wanted to be able to go through and model and deploy in an automated fashion all of the switch to switch links that make up the physical fabric. But not just the switch to switch links. I wanted to be able to map out to the compute environment that runs on Cisco UCS. If you're not familiar with Cisco UCS, there's a huge amount of the networking structure, how we connect from the physical network that you might think of, the switches that are there, all the way down into the physical network adapters that connect into the individual ser uh, physical server components. Well, that network needed to be modeled as well and controlled, as well as the virtual switching layer that went in from VMware. Um, so that's the underlay component as it went in. And so the idea was I wanted to be able to model this out into something that we'll call a, a VLAN fabric, right? A layer two fabric on which or into which we place a number of switches, routers, firewalls, virtual switches from VMware, physical compute environments, right? All of those components make up a VLAN fabric for what we're going to go after. And the idea behind a fabric is if uh, the, the VLAN 100 means the same thing on any two devices, they're part of the same fabric. As soon as VLAN 100 might mean a different network segment, that would be a different VLAN fabric. So for our environment, we kind of have a couple of VLAN fabrics that lay out. The one large one here kind of boxed off that makes up the, the, the large kind of um, spine part of the, the network you see here on the topology is what we would call our internal fabric. That's the majority of our data center. And then we have smaller VLAN fabrics that kind of live between security and routing points. So between the outside of our firewalls and the inside of our DMZ router would be another VLAN fabric. And then outside of our DMZ router and then inside of our edge firewalls is another DMZ or another VLAN fabric. And then on top of that VLAN fabric, we start to deploy our tenant services. And so here you can see they're popping up across the environment. A tenant for us is that overlay. It's a, it's a combination of a bunch of resources that have a common security zone or common purpose for those, as well as the firewalls that control access. And we need the ability to spin up multiple VLAN tenants on top of a single VLAN fabric and connect them to the appropriate um, firewalls. Now, I've, I've used this concept of services and VLAN fabrics and tenants and firewalls. I've mentioned them a few times because those drive the actual network automation services that we built. Now, we, we're going to talk a bit about how we've done this using Cisco NSO, but the general uh, thought process, structure, and approach that we used could be leveraged with any number of network automation tools. We just happen to use Cisco NSO for our structure. And what, NSO, uh, what we built with NSO were these three services the VLAN fabric service to manage the physical underlay, the VLAN tenant service that allows us to spin up layer two, layer three domains on top of a VLAN fabric and manage them independently, and then firewall services that allow us to simplify and can make consistent the security endpoints in and out of these different tenants as they go through. Now the approach we took to actually build these out start out kind of in this prototyping phase. And I like to break things down into simple steps. And so I had three steps to our prototyping and building phase for this. Now, the first step was all about the user experience. And the users in this case was myself, as well as my fellow network engineers and data center engineers that had to deploy and manage our fabrics and services that are there. Now, the goal was to take us away from the world where we managed individual network device and um, compute device and virtualization device configurations independently. We wanted to bring these together. 
And so we've built out a, a data model that represents what a VLAN fabric means to us. So for example, here in the screenshot, you see VLAN fabric internal, and then that fabric will be made up of a series of switch pairs, as well as fabric interconnects and VMware DVSs, on which those VLAN 100s mean the same thing that are consistent across all the places. Now, on top of the VLAN fabric, we're going to go ahead and deploy VLAN tenants. Now, our data model here represents what do we want to articulate? And the key part about these data models is I don't want to focus on every single knob, every single configuration line that might go into one of our, our switches or router configs. We're focusing on the parts that we need to tweak and tune for each one of these deployments that we might do. And so here you can see we focus on things like the static routes. A particular tenant like our admin is going to need a series of static routes. We also need to be able to um, talk about the different networks that exist inside of the tenants. And so here you can see we have network admin containers and network admin main. These represent different layer two um, uh, network segments that go through. And we're using VLANs to back those inside of our environment today, but we built the data model for the future to be able to potentially support VXLAN style segmentation as well. Now notice that the VLAN tenant lives on top of a fabric, in this case, the internal fabric as it goes through. Now the pseudocode that we see here and on the previous screen kind of describes what we want to configure, either through a CLI interface that's offered by Cisco NSO, but each one of these also is, um, can be exposed through like a NetConf or RESTConf API through the platform. We're just describing what is it in, in the kind of the language that we want to work with, be that CLI or API driven. And then finally, um, we can, or the next step as we move out of step one, where we're kind of talking about the data model, we move into step two. And this is where we talk about the final device configurations that have to be generated. Before we start working with templates or code, we need to know what the end state needs to look like. And so we go ahead and we went ahead and, and configured natively using the CLI capabilities, use the native configurations across our network components, what we wanted an end state to look like for a specific fabric and maybe a couple of tenants. And so here you can see that we've made a configuration for part of a VPC relationship on a couple of Nexus switches. And then once I've got that configured, here's an area where Cisco NSO provides us a handy, useful feature, is it can take this native configuration and convert this directly into an XML modeled um, topology. So in this example, we see the same configuration from the previous slide, but now it's all written inside of XML. And then with that XML, I can start putting in kind of the, the variables for the elements of the configurations that will change based on the fabric or the tenant I might be working on. So here we can see that I'll move ahead and now I've got a variable in for the name of the device. I've got a variable in for the VPC domain ID and the keep alive addresses that go through. And then if I build this out, you can see that the rest of this template, which is what we're creating as a configuration template, gets flushed out with the other components that make up the configuration inside of our service. Now our final step, step three, is where the, the data model from our pseudocode is put together with those templates, and that's done inside of Python. And so here you can see a simplified representation of some of the Python code that takes in and creates the variables that will be injected into a particular template based on the service model that's being used. Now that was a really quick run through of kind of how we built these automation pieces. Unfortunately, there's only so much we can do in a 25 or 30 minute presentation. If anybody has more questions about how um, the NSO services are built or the details, we've got some links available at the end of the presentation that you can dive deeper into some of the code. And actually we've posted a lot of this service code up on GitHub for anybody to take a look at, should you want to look at it some more. Now, a key piece that enabled us to be successful along this entire project is that we looked at network automation like software developers look at kind of building applications. And a big part of that is the necessity around multiple environments. Um, for a long time, network engineers, data center engineers have only had a single environment, right? We've had production, the actual data center network or even enterprise or WAN networks on which our applications run and our users access our services. Well, that just doesn't cut it anymore. Um, frankly, it shouldn't have cut it for as long as it did. But when we're talking about automation and kind of being more agile and rapid and making changes and deploying new services into our data centers, we need to have things like a development, test, production pipeline 
over which we send our configurations and our automation strategies. And we knew this going into our automation project for the new data center, and we've built our pipeline from that from day one. Everything starts in a dev type of a world. This means that I or any one of the other engineers on my team can run a development instance of our data center running all of the automation code the, 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 and all of the device simulations so that we can test out automation changes in our templates, our models, our Python that puts them together. That can all be done independent of any other network engineer uh, running and using resources just on any one of our laptops. That lightweight um, individual engineer development environment is really important for rapid evolution and um, uh, deployments of changes and new features into our services. Now after development, we have our test world. And this is where that Cisco modeling lab style infrastructure that we talked about at the beginning continues to give us value. Is our test environment is a virtualized shared resource. Now we could give every one of our developers and engineers their own virtualized test environment. All that would be required for that case would be kind of the, the virtualized platform and resources to spin up the virtual network. But even for us, right, that's a huge footprint. Each one of our networks that spin up because we are modeling the internet, their, our DMZ, our internal environment, application servers, end users as they go through, that's a, that's a big commitment to give every single engineer one of those. And so we treat our test environment as a shared resource. After test, we go into pre-production. This looks just like production. It's only smaller as it goes in. And in fact, it's not just pre-production for network automation. It's also pre-production for the application systems that make up the DevNet Sandbox platform. So when we need to do uh, upgrades to our, our application servers, our orchestration engines, that happens in pre-production, just like our network changes do. And this gives us a, an excellent place to make sure that our network design and automation solutions will work as expected before they're finally moved to production, which is the end customer servicing environment as it goes through. This pipeline of dev, test, pre-prod production is absolute requirement to enable us to achieve the goals that we did. And I highly tell any network engineer, any IT leader I talk to, that this is an important part of what they have to do as well. Now, as we come to the end, a few lessons that we learned along the way. Right? You have to be flexible. I don't think this is new to network engineers. We've always had to be flexible. But when we take on automation, we have to treat it just the same way we have everything else in our network engineering world, knowing that things that we initially plan may not work out exactly as expected. you got to be flexible. Learn to roll with those punches. But you also have to know when to say no. Right? At some point, you've got to balance out full flexibility versus having to deliver and, and be consistent in reliability. It's, you're constantly balancing uh, customization and capabilities versus reliability, testing, and consistency. And that's a balance you have to find for yourselves. Another one we noticed was performance tuning. Figuring out how long something would take the resources required to do something in dev on my laptop um, was very different than what the performance and the expectations were when we moved to our test environment or pre-production. Doing something for 20 pods in test is very different than doing something across a thousand pods in production. And so we're constantly tuning, still today, the performance knobs around our automation scripts that are there. And then we've got perfect, maybe the enemy of good, but there are some decisions you have to live with. And so as you dive into these projects, you have to realize that setting your goal to be absolutely perfect, to get everything done the way you want it, is probably not reasonable. You do eventually have to deliver something but you also have to know that you may get stuck with uh, a decision that you make once that code is put into production. It's very difficult to make changes to those types of things after they've been put into production. Now, what comes next for us in the sandbox world around network automation? Well, we plan to build some new services. I'm currently working on a new service called VPNless that will uh, ideally provide the ability for end users to access some of our sandboxes without needing a VPN. We're also looking at deploying some CI CD for our service pipelines. A lot of our, our uh, we're doing a bit of manual orchestration to deploy some of our code updates. And then we're also working on bring, bring, continuing to train and bring more of our engineers up to speed with some of these new areas. Now, if you've got questions on this or anything else uh, related to network automation or Cisco DevNet, feel free to stay in touch. My contact information is here. And for the foreseeable future, I, like everybody else, my status is working from home and enjoying every day. Thanks, everybody.